adaptation was central to Darwin's own conception of evolution through natural selection. Success in Darwin's struggle for existence was tied to aptitude. Apt individuals would leave more offspring than inapt individuals. Natural selection of the apt would, over many generations, produce lineages that tended toward greater aptitude. Adaptation, in a word. In the aftermath of the crisis of Darwinism, the new Darwinism that emerged was a form of gene selection. Now, adaptation was no longer tied to apt function, but became the selection of apt function genes. For the time, this was a brilliant intellectual achievement, and it cemented into place the modern conception of Darwinism as gene selection, where it still dominates. Brilliant though it was, however, because it trapped modern Darwinism into a tautology that sits at its heart, that makes the Darwinian idea an incoherent theory of evolution. The problem is that the Darwinian idea has no coherent theory of adaptation any longer. What I intend to do here is to start building a more coherent theory of adaptation coming from my perspective as a physiologist and ecologist. And this will eventually lead us into a new perspective on evolution that, among other things, negates the Darwinian idea, whether it be the classical Darwinism of Darwin himself or its modern gene-centered conception. Adaptation is something organisms do. When Darwin wondered about the origin of species, he was thinking of species as a category of types of organisms. A species of finch, in other words, is recognizable as a species because finches can be grouped together on the basis of similarity in form and function, like those species of Galapagos finches. Finches from one island constitute a different species from finches from another island because each species can be differentiated on the shape and strength of their bills. Yet missing from this is a good understanding of what an organism actually is. What are organisms? We all have a pretty good intuitive feel for what organisms are. I'm an organism, for example, and so are you. So is my dog, and so are the birds that fly through the sky the bees that fertilize flowers, and the plants they help fertilize. We think of an organism as some self-contained, coherently organized living thing. An organism has persistence through time. It grows, matures, reproduces, and dies. Being self-contained, organisms should therefore exist within some kind of container, skins, or shells, or exoskeletons. But that can't quite be the whole story. I, an organism, am made up of several trillion individual cells. Is each of those cells an organism as well? Sounds reasonable. There are lots of single-cell creatures out there. They're self-contained and autonomous, contained within cell membranes. Why would they not be organisms? I can't think of a good reason why they shouldn't be. Okay, let's pose a more difficult example. What about a colony of social insects, like those termites I study, or a beehive? The colony itself consists of a group of indisputable organisms, the individual termites or individual bees. But the intriguing thing about social insect colonies is that the colony itself behaves as if it were itself an organism. It's self-contained, autonomous, and adaptive. The individual organisms within seem to have a subordinate existence to the colony, similar to how my individual cells are subordinate to the organism that is me. Yet social insect colonies behave so much like organisms that they're sometimes given a special name, a superorganism. Okay, it gets weirder. Bacteria are cells, so individual bacteria should qualify as organisms, but they don't really live like individual organisms. They often live in complex, diffuse ecosystems called microbial mats, 
For about the first two billion years of the existence of life on Earth, microbial mats were the only form of life that existed. Could a microbial mat be an organism? Well, arguably, it could. And it gets weirder still. There's a theory, quite a credible theory in my view, called Gaia theory, that the entire biosphere is a kind of super, super organism. On what grounds can the biosphere be claimed to be an organism? What's clear from our little excursion into weirdness is that we need to give more thought to the whole idea of an organism, especially if we're going to be able to think clearly about the evolution of new organisms. Let's start to unpack this problem. Imagine that we have a bucket with a hole in it. When we pour water into this leaky bucket, water will leak out the bottom. If we keep pouring water in, eventually the water level in the leaky bucket will rise to a point where flow in equals flow out through the hole. But what level is that? Let's analyze this. We compare the water level in the bucket with the rate of water flowing in. If the water is flowing in from the faucet slowly, the water level will come to some steady value where flow in equals flow out. If we increase the rate of water flowing in from the faucet, open the tap a bit more, the water level in the bucket will rise until water flow out through the hole again equals the rate of water flow in. This leaky bucket analogy applies to cells as well. A cell is enclosed within a cell membrane. The cell membrane partitions the world into two environments, an internal environment within the cell and an external environment in which it lives. Materials flow back and forth across this boundary. This means that the cell operates essentially as if it were a leaky bucket. I want to focus on one particular element, namely potassium ions, that flow back and forth across the membrane. Potassium is symbolized with an uppercase K, and the plus superscript indicates that the potassium is a positively charged ion. We're going to look at potassium ion concentration on either side of the membrane. Concentration, in this example, is the analog of the water level in the leaky bucket, and will indicate concentration with the size of the label. We'll start with the assumption that concentrations are the same on both sides of the membrane, indicated by both labels being the same size. Okay, how do potassium ions move across this membrane? Cell membranes have embedded within them proteins which can act as potassium pumps. Energy is expended to pick up potassium from the external environment and force it into the internal environment. These pumps are like the faucet in our leaky bucket analogy. As potassium is pumped in, the potassium concentrations within the cell will therefore increase. Now here is an important point. Potassium ions pumped into the cell remove potassium from the environment outside the cell. Potassium concentrations outside the cell will therefore decrease. Also embedded within the membrane are channels which allow potassium ions to flow from inside the cell back to the outside. The difference of concentration controls this rate. These channels are like the hole in a leaky bucket. Okay, let's start filling in more details. Like we did for the leaky bucket, we'll plot the potassium ion concentrations as a function of how rapidly the pump is pushing potassium in. When the pump is acting slowly, potassium concentrations within the cell will come to a lower equilibrium concentration compared to when the pump is moving potassium in rapidly. Okay, let's now ramp things up a little bit. On our axis, we'll now look at potassium concentration inside the cell compared to outside the cell. And we'll also add a little meter which senses internal potassium concentration. When potassium concentration increases within the cell, the needle moves to the right. And when internal potassium concentrations decline, the needle moves to the left. Now, if we increase the pumping rate, 
potassium concentrations within the cell will increase. What happens if the exterior potassium concentration increases also? Well, the interior potassium concentration will increase along with it. What a particular pumping rate does is to maintain the difference of concentrations between the interior and exterior of the cell. Let's now add another component in which the meter controls the pumping rate. We can engineer this so that pumping rate is controlled by what the potassium meter reads. Now, the interior potassium concentration can be maintained at a steady level, even if potassium concentrations in the exterior vary. In other words, the cell membrane is acting as an adaptive boundary that helps maintain the cell's internal environment at some state, irrespective of what happens in the exterior environment. In short, the boundary manages adaptation of the cell to environmental circumstance. Phew, that seemed to be a complicated diversion, but it's led us to a provisional definition of the organism, the question we started with, remember? To wit, an organism is a living system that is contained within an adaptive boundary. This definition of the organism is physiological in nature. It's not concerned with objects like bill size, but with processes. The flows of matter across the boundary moved by pumps embedded in the cell membrane, the channels. There's a lot more to this, of course, but that's really the essence. Together, the processes mediated by the adaptive boundary confer upon the cell its integrity, its responsiveness, and its adaptability. By this definition, the cell clearly qualifies as an organism, which seems sensible. But what about more conventionally defined organisms like myself? Am I an organism? Or am I an assemblage of trillions of cellular organisms? The answer to that question is yes and no. That's not a waffle on my part. It's my opening to a concept I call the extended organism. Let me explain. Anytime a membrane pump transports a potassium ion across the membrane into the cell, increasing its concentration there, it's taking a potassium ion from outside of the cell, decreasing its concentration there. That's simple conservation of mass. So the adaptive boundary of the cell membrane is certainly affecting the environment contained within the boundary, the cell's internal environment, but it's also affecting the environment outside the boundary. In other words, the physiology mediated by the adaptive boundary affects the environment on both sides of the membrane. And this leads us to a somewhat startling conclusion. Physiology is not just something that happens inside the cell. It extends to the environment outside the cell as well. Any modification of the cell's internal environment is reflected in an opposite modification of its external environment. In short, the physiology of the cell is extended. And here's a weird conclusion that follows from that logic. If the cell qualifies as an organism, based upon it being contained within an adaptive boundary, and if the cell's physiology extends to both sides of the adaptive boundary, the cell, the organism, is actually an extended organism. This extended organism is therefore a kind of conspiracy, in the literal sense of the word as breathed together, of environments on both sides of an adaptive boundary, internal and external. It's that conspiracy which resolves the question I just posed. Am I an organism or am I an assemblage of cellular organisms? Let's see how using the common earthworm as an example. Earthworms are one species of a large family of segmented worms. They consist of a number of similar segments lined up along the body's long axis, 
Each segment contains within it its own kidney of sorts, a set of tubules known as a nephridium. Each nephridium manages the flow of water between the water contained within the segment and the environment. Now, there's a curious thing about earthworms. They're not really earthworms, that is to say, animals equipped physiologically for a terrestrial existence. Rather, they're freshwater aquatic worms that happen to live in soil. I'm not picking nits here. Earthworms nephridia are built to handle the unique water balance problems of living in fresh water. If earthworms were truly earthworms, they would have different nephridia, ones more suited to the dehydrating environment of the terrestrial environment. Equipped with the nephridia they have, earthworms living on land, rather than fresh water, are prone to dehydrate and die. Yet they don't. They thrive there. This seems to be a paradox. If earthworms are not adapted to terrestrial circumstances, how can they live there? Good question. The answer is to be found in this concept of the extended organism. We've already established that the cell acts as an extended organism, separating two environments by the adaptive boundary of the cell membrane. To help keep things straight going forward, I'm going to label the cell's internal environment E0 and the external environment as E1, and we'll label the cell membrane adaptive boundary as B1. The nephridium tubule is built from a sheet of cells known as an epithelium. Like the cell membrane, this sheet partitions two new environments. One is the body water, where the earthworm cells live, or E1, and the other is the new environment contained within the tubule, which will give a new name, E2. And the epithelium constitutes a new adaptive boundary, which I'll label B2. Just for reference, here's the cartoon of that nephridium within the tubule I just showed with the labels and boundaries, just to help keep it in context. And finally, here's the worm itself, sitting in its external environment, the soil, which I'll label E3. So the worm organism consists of at least two extended organisms nested within each other. The extended organism of the cell, bounded by the adaptive boundary of the cell membrane, B1, is nested within an epithelial extended organism, bounded by the epithelium, B2. The cell membrane sustains conditions within the cell, and the nephridium sustains conditions for the cells themselves to live and together they sustain the earthworm organism. So that's how we combine all the cellular organisms that inhabit a body with a larger organism of the body itself. The body itself is a conspiracy of two extended organisms. Working together, they constitute the organism per se. But why stop there? Could the earthworm itself be an extended organism? How would that work? The worm organism is embedded in the environment of the soil it inhabits, E3. If the soil environment is dry, the worm organism cannot survive there. The worm organism is not equipped to live in dry soils. And even if it rains, water may not percolate very deeply into the soil before it evaporates away, and the worm is still left high and dry, so to speak. But here's where things get really interesting. Earthworms are noted for modifying their soil environment. They continually tunnel through soils and mulch it with their feces. As the worms do so, water from rainfalls can now percolate more deeply into the soil so that it will be retained in the soil for a longer time after rains pass. By this soil modification, the earthworm becomes an extended organism itself, turning the modified soil into a new adaptive boundary, B3. The earthworm and soil have now entered into a larger conspiracy, that word again, between worm and the soil to create a soil environment that is wetter and cooler and that enables the essentially aquatic earthworm to survive and thrive there. And here's the important thing. This adaptive conspiracy is not simply the worm adapting to its environment. It's equal measure the worm adapting the soil to itself, both worm and soil constitute an extended organism.
Once you get this idea of the extended organism, you can see extended organisms everywhere you look. Those termite mounds and colonies are an obvious example, but it extends further. The ecosystem inhabited by numerous colonies of these termites is itself a conspiracy of termite colonies to re-engineer their habitats on a massive scale. They turn over massive amounts of soil and restructure the hydrology of their habitats on an ecosystem-wide scale. So ecosystems can be extended organisms. And why stop there? There's technically no limit to how deeply extended organisms can be nested within one another. The only limit seems to be the limits of the biosphere itself. And this means that the living Earth itself can be considered an extended organism. There's nothing mystical about any of this. It's based solely on some elementary physiology and basic physical principles, like the conservation of mass. But this notion of nestable extended organisms gives us a new foundation for thinking about organisms and adaptation. As I've already said, that itself is not really a new idea. Aristotle thought along similar lines, and so did Darwin. All I've done here really is reframe the issue in a different language of form and function. This opens the next question. If the biosphere is a conspiracy of innumerable extended organisms, what are they conspiring to do? Mm -hmm.